Hey, what's going on, guys? So something really exciting happened this past week. I passed my Part 107 exam with an 88% on the very first try. In this video, I'm going to share with you guys the things I did and the resources I, I used to prepare for my Part 107 exam. Got that coming up. Alright guys, so really I'm just going to keep this short and sweet because there are so many, so many resources out there to assist you in passing your Part 107 exam. A lot of YouTube videos that will prepare you much better than I could, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to share those videos with you and those resources, and I'm going to put those links below in the description to make it really, really easy. So initially when I was trying to sign up and schedule to take my Part 107 exam, it was really, really complicated. I mean, the FAA website is a typical government website, and it was really, really complicated, and I just couldn't even figure out how to sign up and schedule to take the exam. So the first thing you got to do is go to the IACRA website, which is a, uh, it's an FAA website, and I'm going to put the link below in the description as well for that website. Once you go to the, to the IACRA FAA website, you're going to create an account. Once you have created an account, you can retrieve an FTN number. With that FTN number, which is this tracking number that the FAA uses for you, you will go to the PSI Testing Center website, and I'll include that description below as well. You'll go to the PSI Testing Center website, create an account, and then utilizing the FTN number that you retrieved on the IACRA FAA website, you will schedule your Part 107 exam. In the website, it's not actually called the Part 107 exam. It's actually your small unmanned aircraft certification. So once you've scheduled that with the testing center, you're good to go and then it's time to cram. Now I was studying for a few months prior to even scheduling my exam, but I know the way my brain works and unless I had scheduled the exam and had a deadline, I wasn't going to cram and obtain the information and be ready to test. So I had to schedule the exam for two weeks out and I just crammed for two weeks and then, and then passed. So the main website that I used to prepare for the exam was Remote Pilot 101. This was a great website had a lot of really in-depth explanations and videos on what you can expect in the Part 107 exam. The instructor was very, very detail-oriented and really got deep into the rules and regulations of the FAA pertaining to drones. Now, looking back, um, I probably didn't need to re-watch all these modules like I did and go as in-depth because, in reality, my exam was pretty simplistic and less broad in material as the Remote Pilot 101 course was. However, again, I would recommend the Remote Pilot 101 course because it really did set a really good precedence and like baseline knowledge of what I needed to know moving forward. For example, I would know why a question was asking me something in a certain way. And I was able to, with that baseline knowledge, out of the three answers that they would give you on a question, immediately roll out the the one of the three that was absolutely wrong that's another thing about this exam for each question there's only three answers so it's pretty easy to rule out which one is absolutely wrong i mean if you gain a baseline knowledge of what this is all about and you have some common sense you can rule out the third answer that is absolutely wrong and then at that point it's just a 50 50 chance of getting it right so again i would i would recommend remote pilot 101 it really does give you a good foundation on what you need to know. I just wouldn't stress about um, going through each module multiple times or catching every single little thing that is explained. I think there's about a dozen modules on uh, Remote Pilot 101, uh, but then like the last three are kind of more like recapping and then one is actually telling you how to sign up to take the exam. You can pretty much skip like the last three and the practice quizzes on Remote Pilot 101 are also very handy. So second, I used videos on YouTube and there's a really good video by Tony Northrup in which he really goes into detail on what to expect on the exam rather than just overwhelming you with information. He does a really good job at giving you prime examples on things you're going to very likely find on your exam. And I'm going to include the link to his video below as well. The other video on YouTube that I utilized was a video by Better B-Roll and that guy spends like two hours going through uh, sample test questions uh, from the exam and that was a very good resource as well gave me a really really good idea and really got me in the mindset on what to expect on the exam and how to answer those questions now I didn't get any questions on the actual exam that were word for word the same as the practice questions but again it definitely got me in the right mindset and really helped me to know what to expect on the exam and how to answer those questions now, a lot of them asked the same question just in a different way so I actually kind of did know the answer 
thanks to this video. So now I want to talk a little bit about the subject matter that you would expect on the exam that I would highly suggest you really focus on in your preparation. Now I passed the exam my first try with an 88% and I'm telling you, like 80% of the questions on my test were regarding map reading and particularly sectional charts. Now if you don't know what a sectional chart is, you're going to get to know them. It's basically this uh, map that shows you all the different airspace and all the different information that you need to know as a pilot. Now actual pilots are very familiar with these and this is what they use to know what kind of airspace they're flying in and who they need to contact to receive permission to enter the airspace or to an airport and land. Now these are things that us as remote pilots won't necessarily use to that extent. Now I strongly feel that the FAA has us take this exam mainly because they want us to have appreciation for all the systems that are in place and these maps and these symbols that have been around for years and years and years. Regardless though, you still need to know how they work because you need to know what airspace you're in and if you need permission to fly in it. You need to know how high you can go before you are in airspace that you shouldn't be in. And again, but if you have like a nice drone, like a DJI drone, the app's actually gonna tell you that you're in no-fly zone and what type of airspace you're in and blah, blah, blah. Don't get annoyed and try to override that stuff. Abide by it because it really is important. So again, so the purpose of my video again isn't to go through every little thing. I'm not going to bring up slides or the symbols. Again, Tony Nothrup and the other guy Better Be Roll did a really good job at, being, at going through every little thing. But I'm just gonna tell you again what I focused on. You need to know how to read a map. If you do not know how to read latitude and longitude yet, you need to learn. You need to learn how to be able to find a landmark on a map utilizing coordinates like that. Learn the general rules of the different airspace. For the most part, you need permission to fly in any and all airspaces but G. Become familiar with the basic rules of these different airspaces. As well, become familiar with the symbols that you'll find on a sectional chart. But don't stress about having every single one of those memorized. Don't stress about having the color and the markings and the hash marks memorized for all the different airspace because in the handbook they give you in the exam, it does have a legend. And in that legend, you can look up a color, you can look up a style of a line, the hash marks or symbols that you'll find in the sectional chart. And you can read right there what it means. You'll find right there in that legend what airspace is what color and in what style of line. So become familiar with them, but don't stress on memorizing them because there's a legend chart in the handbook that you will get when you go to take the test. Okay, aside from becoming familiar with sectional charts and maps and how to read them, also you're gonna wanna learn how to read a METAR or a TAF report. These are basically weather reports. You need to learn how to read when they were produced, how long they're valid for, what all the letters and numbers mean in regards to the weather, uh, visibility, precipitation, all these things. And you're not gonna learn that unless you utilize one of those resources like Remote Pilot 101 or Tony's video, where they go step by step by step and teach you what sequence and numbers each of those things are. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, it looks like Reformed Egyptian or something. So make sure that you learn how to read those. Now they provide a calculator for you or they tell you to bring a calculator. Um, I use my calculator once, I had one question in which I needed to make a calculation on my exam, and it was for the load factor chart. So on the exam, you get an example of a load factor chart in the handbook, and there's actually an index where it gives you what the load factor is per each weight, as long as you know how to find it on the graph based on the degrees that the question's asking you. And all you do is you multiply the weight times the load factor, and that basically gives you the weight that the structure of the aircraft needs to be able to support at that specific degrees. Again. Both Better B-Roll and Tony walk through it step by step. Just learn how to make that simple calculation and you'll be fine. And the last thing I really, really want to give emphasis on in preparation for the Part 1 of 7 exam is know your numbers, okay? these There's there's no replacement for having these memorized, so you just got to memorize them. You've got to memorize your minimum weight for a unmanned aircraft before you have to register it with the FAA, which is 0.55 pounds. You need to know the maximum weight of an unmanned aircraft before it's no longer considered a drone, which is 55 pounds. So know that you gotta be 2,000 feet away from clouds horizontally. Know that you gotta be 2,000 feet away from guy wires. Guy wires are those wires that, that are basically kinda like at a 45 degree angle leading away from radio towers holding them up. There's several all the way around. You gotta remain at least 2,000 feet away from those. Know that you gotta remain at least 500 feet below clouds. Know that your max speed of a drone legally is 100 miles per hour. Know that the FAA wants you to be able to see three statute miles 
before flying your drone. Now, I'd be shocked if you could see your drone past a mile, so three statute miles, whatever. But the FAA wants you to be able to visibly see three statute miles away from you before deciding to fly your drone. Know that eight hours need to have passed before you can fly your drone after consuming alcohol. Know that the legal alcohol level to man a drone is 0 0.04. Know that you can legally fly your drone 30 minutes prior to sunrise and 30 minutes after sunset. Know that you can legally fly your drone 400 feet above the surface. As well, know that you can fly your drone up to 400 feet above a structure as long as you're within a 400 foot radius. Now that's just a handful of the numbers that you need to memorize prior to that exam. You cannot find these numbers in the legend in the handbook that's given to you at the exam. Memorize the numbers. And again, all those numbers I just went over, Tony Northstrup does a really good job at going over all those numbers in the beginning of his video. All right, so that's not too bad, right? Use those resources. They're great resources. I swear by them. I got an 88% on my first try. I watched Tony Northrup's video twice, and I went through Better B-Roll's video once, all the way through. All right, good luck to you guys, and you got this. Oh,